Good afternoon. I'm Gene DiIorio, Vice President and Treasurer of the Greystone Society. And it's a wonderful pleasure to have so many of you here and to welcome you on this rather historic and momentous occasion as we have successfully brought back to Coatesville these trees and other memorabilia of the World Trade Center in New York. You'll be hearing a great deal more about that a bit later. Thank you. This is an exciting day for us who have worked on this. And uh, as I said to Scott Houston as we came home at midnight last night from watching these being loaded at JFK, did you ever think we'd bring it off? And thank God we have. And we're happy to have you all here to share it with us. I'm going to ask you to rise as the Lucan's Band plays the national anthem and remain standing for the invocation. Thank you, gentlemen, and now the invocation by Reverend William Shaw. Bill? Let's pray. Our Father, Creator in heaven, as we begin this ceremony, we invoke your presence, not because we have to or because of tradition, but because we acknowledge your providence, your grace, and everything about you that gives us life, breath, and the ability to stand here today. We've come to recognize the return of the World Trade Center steel, where it was created and shipped out on its fateful journey. We're soberly reminded of all it represents. We find it no accident that the steel that once served as the grateful gateway to the one of the most significant economic landmarks on this planet, one that was targeted by evil forces in our generation's darkest hour, would once again survive the unimaginable pressures placed upon it by its destiny and return as an inspiration to a city seeking amidst the pressures we face today, such inspiration. No one but you foreknew such an incredible plan. We thank you for the workers who've dedicated their lives to the trade, particularly at this Coatesville Mill. Some who stand here today were here more than 40 years ago when this journey began. When you gave Israel's king the charge to build a dwelling place for you in Jerusalem, it was the metal workers and other craftsmen who carried out this holy task. The men and women of this mill who continue to use the gifts you've given them stand with those heroes today. And as our city celebrates the 200th anniversary of steelmaking in Coatesville, we thank you for the heritage of the family that has been here all along 
and work so hard to preserve the highest and most noble aspects of their history, entrepreneurship in the local, domestic, and international marketplace, compassion, and generosity. We thank you for them. Lord, your word says, for our struggles not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. These steel trees will now ever remind this city of the stand. So, Lord, we not only invoke your presence today, but also humbly ask your merciful blessing upon it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Bill, for that wonderful invocation. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the Greystone Society, Scott Houston. He and I worked on this project, but on a lot of others, and I've come to admire and respect Scott for his deep appreciation of history, not just Coatesville and his families, but his historic interest in so many areas. We've looked at battlefields and historic monuments, and it's been great working with Scott and recognizing the energy and I would say the passion that he has put into this project. So Scott is going to give our keynote address and tell you the development of this project. Scott? All right. One of, yeah, I wrote this one down. Um, I first want to uh, just recognize the uh, a lot of the, the truckers and the haulers are sitting over here, and uh, they've been working really hard. <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of people to thank. I, I won't be thanking everybody, uh, because everybody here is a part of this. It's uh, it's on your shoulders that I'm here today to, to talk to you about what you've uh, allowed me to do and uh, to talk about this a little bit. I think number one is the first question that everybody really wants to know is, you know, what is the significance of all of this? And uh, I think that's a hard question to answer. I, I certainly, for one, will not be able to give you meaning for these pieces. I think these pieces in the street are, are ours and they're the America's pieces, and I want everybody here to understand what happened and to derive their own meaning and take away that these pieces and what they mean. First and foremost for me on this is, um, you know, just to never forget September 11, 2001. And this is what this is about, the people who lost their lives during that day, and especially the first responders who are so well represented here today. Uh, the, first, the first responders, uh, I know one of the, the drivers yesterday reminded me that first responders run in when everybody's running out. And uh, I think that that is a, a bravery uh, that we all admire. And uh, I really applaud all of the first responders who are here today. Thank you very much for, for coming. So, you know, having said that, I think, you know, we want to, uh, I want to thank a couple people first off and foremost is the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, Peter Miller and uh, Executive Director Chris Ward for uh, facilitating this and helping us get through this process. Um, I would also like to uh, thank Arcelor Middle, Ed Fry, and John Hayes, and uh, Bob Freshly for all of their help in getting this uh, getting this down. Uh, again, we wouldn't be able to do it without Citadel Bank and uh, Doug Thompson and Ed uh, Mayer and uh, uh, Tom Gugarty. Uh, I would also specifically like to, to thank Eric Flynn and EPJ. Uh, really, he's a, not a former Marine. He is a Marine and uh, knows how to get it done. And uh, really thank uh, e EPJ and Chris. Thank you very much. And, um, and lastly, I, I wouldn't be here without my family. My Aunt Nancy uh, is here tonight and uh, my mom and my dad. So I really appreciate that as well. But I, I really want to talk about you know, September 11th and, and what that means and when did we begin this process and how did this process come about? Um, it was shortly after September 11th when the rescue operations are uh, wrapping up and it's moving into the salvage phase that I believe it was Phil Trace and the, uh, the Steelworkers Union 1165 uh, came to my office and 
were, you know, we were discussing the, the project and the 152 trees that were made here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the life cycle of steel. You know, the, these pieces were melted here in Coatesville. They were scrap and they moved here. They went into the furnace and the forces that, that manufacture steel, 3,000 degrees, and the steel workers that really sweat on a daily basis in this plant to turn out some great products. And the products that this company and the steel workers have turned out here in Coatesville for 200 years has really been remarkable. Uh, so I really want to thank them. It started in 1968, or maybe a little bit before, with the creation of these steel trees, and they were manufactured in uh, Plant 5 and flame cut. Uh, my dad uh, was key to telling me about a lot about the process, and they, they moved out of Coatesville on three flat cars and headed up to New York City for their, for their destiny, and uh, were, were put together by Pittsburgh, Des Moines, and, and the World Trade Center towers were, were completed almost 30, uh, 40 years ago. So. The, the life of these trees were intended as an office building in New York City for the world. And I don't think anybody uh, imagined an attack on our civilian population the way that it went down. Um, it was truly a remarkable day for a lot of people when civilians were on the front line and the first responders needed to go back for them. Uh, and, and the bravery in, 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 that needed to take place to do that. Um, after September 11th, the salvage effort is underway, and, and we begin to understand that the, the steel is being, you know, they, New York wants to move this site out, and they want to get it cleared and take their time doing that diligently. But we became aware of the salvage operations, and it's at that point uh, where we began to make inroads about, you know, what was being done with the steel. Uh, we didn't want it all to be scrapped or shipped overseas, and other uh, organizations were coming to light to save some things. So in the end, Lukens made 150, and there, here's some more truck drivers coming in. So, uh, you know, I just want everybody to thank them. <laughs> and I, it really undertook uh, significance. The trees became a lasting symbol of the salvage efforts. Uh, they that's when they really began to undertake a different uh, iconic symbol of the day and the, and the community and the spirit of New York and pulling together and really the sense of, 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 uh, of the effort undertaken. I think uh, Lieutenant Ryan from the Port Authority reminded me that the footprint of each building was an acre. There were two of them and they were 120 stories tall. So the salvage effort was attempting to clear 220 acres of rubble uh, in the middle of downtown New York, and that took a great undertaking. And I know a lot of people participated in that, and we were able to talk to them up in New York about uh, their efforts on the pile and the salvage efforts. And so those people should not be forgotten as well in their dedication and, and their commitment to trying to clean up and move on, and that's really what this is about. These pieces are coming home. It's a part of the reconciliation. We want to bring them here again to begin the healing and to talk about you know, the event and to keep it in the forefront of everybody's mind, uh, the, the cost and the, the effort that was undertaken to, uh, you know, during our country during, uh, during that time frame. The, uh, the pieces are, uh, are quite amazing, no doubt. Uh, there are, real briefly, we brought down, um, in the end, as I said, we made 152 trees, and there were 18 that were left after the salvage operations had, uh, had, had taken place. So we were working with the Port Authority in the New York with whatever was left. That's what, whatever was left, we, we wanted to bring it home. And um, it's really amazing that we have 10 trees to bring home. So this is really, you know, an important day, but I, I, by no means is this the end. I think now the community of Coatesville and all involved have been charged with these pieces are coming home. We must begin to you know, I, I, we have some concepts here, but we must begin to take the pieces, understand what they are, and form them into a lasting memorial that would be open to the public and free, and that we would be able to respectfully honor the steel workers, the first responders, and of course, all of the parents, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children who passed away on that day. Uh, we don't want to just focus on New York. We would like to also recognize the Pentagon and Schwanksville as well, and the cost of that. Um, I think that's pretty much where we go from here. I, I really want everybody to come up, uh, you know, and share their experiences with the trees. This is really the first time that they've been out and publicly accessible in 10 years, and they are very powerful pieces. 
So by, no, you know, by all means, go up and touch them. By no means can I convey to you what you can take away from this. The only thing I really want you to remember is you know, they're 110 stories tall, and the people in their last moments, who are you going to call? You're in a smoky room, 110 up. You're not coming home, and you're, it's the end. And then you know that there is help on the way. And thank God for our fighter fighters and those people who will go into these buildings and go and get you and attempt to. They're up 87 floors. And remember, it's fire, it's smoke, it is chaos, and they are going in to help us. So, again, this really is all about the first responders and the victims, and I just really appreciate everybody and the work that they've done to allow me to get up here and to address you all. It's been my honor, my pleasure to work with this, but by no, I am just a small part in this. Again, the truck drivers, EPJ, ArcelorMittal, Citadel, and again, a lot of the dignitaries that are up here, they're going to speak. So again, I thank you for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, for that very impressive explanation and uh, your demonstration of very heavy understanding. We all recognize this is not just historic relics. There's an enormous amount of patriotism and significance to these pieces. Uh, he mentioned our dedication or our, our gratitude to ArcelorMittal, and we have with us uh, Ed Fry who is the general manager of the Arcelor Middle Planter here, and he's going to give you greetings. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Like all of you, we're standing here today, and I think we'll all remember this moment, and it'll be burned into our memory. And more significantly, everybody in the U.S. knows where they were that moment, September 11, 2001. Terrorists attacked hundreds of men, women, and children, innocent men, women, and children, and lost their lives. And thanks to the first responders, the, e the emergency personnel, the policemen, the firefighters who ran in and saved lives, and at the same time lost their life in that battle. We appreciate and applaud Scott, Gene, and Greystone for bringing these pieces home. Steelmakers made them. And it's neat, in the 200th year, un the unfortunate event brings them home. 152 of them left the plant, somewhere between one and seven inches thick. Um, soccer made sure they got on rail cars. Uh, Bruce Young saw the stenciling on some of them. So these really connect with people that are here in various ways. And again, th thanks to Scott, Gene, and Greystone for bringing them home. And ArcelorMittal is happy to provide the support for them in this, in this event and throughout their uh, journey to fulfill their vision. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for your enormous assistance in this project uh, with us. Uh, before I make the next introductions with all the expressions to the firefighters, uh, I'm happy to say that we have a delegation from the New York Fire Department with us. Would you gentlemen stand up? This is an important day for Coatesville, and it's now my pleasure to introduce officials of the city who will give you greetings. First of all, Mr. Ted Reed, who is Coatesville's general manager. Ted. Good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to be here on this very auspicious occasion. I don't think that there is a single person here today, if they had a choice, would rather that this steel still be standing in the Twin Towers and all of the buildings still there and all of those lives still living. It is an occasion that we memorialize every September 11 and every day 
as well. The steel is symbolizing more to us today, not only because it's coming home, but because it is the part of a tragedy that came to this country unexpectedly, but this country persevered. This steel still stood while the rest of the buildings fell and all of those people perished. The steel symbolizes today the resiliency of not only the steel company in America, not only Lucan Steel Company, now ArcelorMetal, but also I think it symbolizes the resiliency of the American way of life because we are still standing and we will continue to stand. Coming home to Coatesville is extremely important to this community because it will symbolize not only the steel being here in, in a memorial, but it will symbolize a rebirth. While the tragedy took the buildings down, the steel still stood, and today it has an opportunity for rebirth in the home where it was made. And through the memorials that will be coming in the next few years, this community can take great, great pride that it is part of history, that it is home, but it is going to be recognized for eons to come as a symbol of the resiliency of the American way of life. So we thank each and every one of you and the first responders, God bless every one of you every day of your life. And to all of those who are here, we look to you to help us to have Coatesville reborn as well, so that in the future, not only pride will embellish everything that we do, but the knowledge that we are part of history will make us even stronger than we are today. Thank you very much for being here, and God bless. Thank you, Ted, for those wonderful words. Now we'll introduce the president of Coatesville City Council. Um, Carl? Or, uh, Earl. Earl. Uh, Ed. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, regrets from Councilman Eggerston Hamrick and uh, Brazel for not being able to be here. They were unable to attend, and they uh, pass on their regrets for not being able to be here. <clears throat> Today is an historic day for the city of Coatesville and the surrounding community. Forty-some years ago, when the Coatesville area was the centerpiece of Chester County, the men and women of Lucan Steel were manufacturing the steel used in the foundation of the world's tallest building. The World Trade Center at that time was the envy of the world. The fact that Lucan Steel was chosen to provide the steel speaks volumes of the hard work and dedication of the people of this area. September 11, 2001 is a day that will never be forgotten by the men, women, and children of this country. Everyone here can probably tell you where they were when they first heard the news. I was at a local restaurant watching the horror unfold live with then Detective Julius Canal who is now our police chief. I will never forget the devastating tragedy that was occurring. The thoughts that came to my mind as it was happening cannot be repeated today. The one thing that I can remember is the historic moment when the dust settled and the world saw that the steel trees were still standing. It symbolizes the strength and determination of this great country. Now, eight and a half years later, as we stand here today, these steel trees represent the resiliency of this very community. Just as those steel trees on September 11th represented a phoenix rising from the ashes, this community will do the same. Just when everyone was, has all but given up on Coatesville, we need to be reminded that now is the time for this city and community to also rise from the ashes. Let's now find the same strength and determination 
of the people who 40 some years ago built these very same steel trees, we can pull together and work hard to once again make Coatesville the great city it once was. I would like to thank the New York and New Jersey Port Authority for donating these historic symbols of strength. I would also like to thank the Stuart Houston Foundation and the Greystone Society for making all of this possible. And especially to the Houston family because they have never given up on the people of Coatesville. I say thank you. I'm confident that these organizations, with lots of help from the local, county, state, and federal agencies, as well as the surrounding communities, will build the National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum that captures the hard work and sacrifices from the men and women who once worked and continue to work in this industry that built this country. They will make everyone involved proud to say that they were involved with it. All I have left to say is, welcome home. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, further words of greeting from the City Council Vice President, uh, Mr. Marking. <clears throat> Another written speech, I apologize. As a society, we often measure our history by the largest successes and the most terrible tragedies. Like these trees, I too was manufactured in the 1960s. Some of the events by which I have measured my own personal history would include the attempted assassination of President Reagan, the Challenger explosion, the death of John F. Kennedy Jr., and the attack on the World Trade Center. As with most Americans, September 11, 2001 was a very long day. I remember it was a day much like today, actually, blue sky and mild. It began like any other day for me. I kissed my loved one goodbye and went to work. And then at about 9 a.m., someone burst into my meeting room and announced that a plane had crashed into one of the Twin Towers. Everyone was stunned, but we just thought, this has to be just a horrible accident. Then just after that, another plane crashed into the South Tower, and suddenly no one could dismiss it as an accident any longer. I received a frantic call from my partner, whose sister, brother, sister-in-law, and sister-in-law's mother all lived or worked around the World Trade Center. He had just hung up with his sister, who as she entered her office building, suddenly shouted into her cell, oh my god, a plane just crashed into the towers. He had already heard, excuse me, <clears throat> he had already heard about the first plane on the news and instantly knew this was no longer an accident. In a panic, he begged her to go back home. He told her not to take the subway, but to simply walk, walk. Soon after, cell service was suspended and for the next nine hours, we waited helpless as our world unraveled, like many others, and we wondered as to the fate of his family and our loved ones. I remember many things from that time. I remember the sick feeling of being completely helpless and having nothing to rely on but the love of those I held dear and my faith. I remember seeing the video of Flight 175 slamming into the South Tower being played over and over and over again to the point where we simply had to turn off the television for a while but then we'd be driven back in the hopes of learning more about the possible fate of our families. And I remember so vividly the sky the next day. I had all this anger and fear and uncertainty inside me, and I went outside and just stared at the sky. And even in the midst of my confusion and uncertainty, I couldn't help but acknowledge how blue and perfect it was. All commercial air traffic had been suspended, and I'd never seen a sky without a jet trail in it. The world had shifted on its axis, and here I was in my backyard, on a beautiful fall day under a flawless blue sky. To this day, from time to time when I sit outside under a blue sky like today and stare at a jet's vapor trail, I think back to that day and how America's innocence and sense of security forever changed. Occurrences like these are the events of American history, but it is how we respond to them, how we move forward, how we rebuild that defines us as Americans. In the 1960s, Coatesville was a thriving city producing steel from one of the most remarkable engineering endeavors in America's history. Steel towns like Coatesville were for many years the foundation of American industry. It sounds almost counterintuitive to think that our steel mill once made something referred to as a tree, 
an oddly organic term for something so rigid and strong, something which would be used as the foundation of one of the world's tallest structures, and then, some four decades, decades later, return back to their birthplace. A fitting metaphor for the almost 3,000 souls who, depending on your religious convictions, were also returned home. Trees often evoke images of wisdom and life. We often hear lists of the dead read at memorial events such as this. So many people dead and buried, others unaccounted for. The grief and loss of this tragedy will be, sort will be sorted out through years to come. It is because of this fact, the length of time that it takes a family or a nation, not only to mourn and to grieve, but to also once again find the gratitude for the living among the wreckage that drives us to put such valiant energy into commemorating events and building tributes. Tributes not just to the grief, but to the gratitude for those who survived. And that is the inherent beauty in symbolism. It is whatever you make of it. So for me, these trees will symbolize the gratitude for life, gratitude for those who survived that long and terrible day. For me, the list of names I'd like to read is brief. Mary Kate Hallahan, Richard Hallahan, Mary Murphy Hallahan, and Jean Krieger, all of whom survived. And as for these trees returning to Coatesville, I believe they still have some work to do as a role, in their role as a foundation. I believe they will be a part of the foundation for the rebirth of Coatesville, rooted in the city's rich history with Luke and Steele, and supporting a diverse and hopefully wiser future, honoring what was lost that terrible day on September 11th, yet standing as a symbol of what the city of Coatesville can achieve. A brighter, stronger, ever more promising tomorrow. The presence of these trees and the memorial we anticipate they will one day anchor will touch lives far beyond the confines of Coatesville's city limits. We welcome today a piece of our past that will forever now be a part of our nat nation's future. Thank you. Thank you for that very moving and I think inspiring comments which I think he has hit what's going through the minds of a great many of us. Now, it's also my pleasure to recognize uh, the mayor of our good neighbor to the south, the borough of South Coatesville, Mayor Kennedy. Good afternoon. Before I start, I would like to thank the Houston family, whom I worked for for a number of years. And I know that the borough of South Coatesville, because they did so much for the borough, the Houston family. So I want to thank you for allowing me just to come up here and say a few words. Skip and I, Lou Irvin, I knew all of the old fellows that worked in the mill. I worked in it for years and years. I retired in 1980. I've been retired for 30 years. And I, I miss Lukens. I miss the people. So they told me not to talk too long, so I did write a little speech. <laughs> that I, but I, he told me not to talk over two minutes, so it won't be two minutes. But I want you to, because I, I really... Love Luke and Steel Company because that's where I made my living. That's where I, I did the things that I did do on account of Lucan's. I thought the governor was going to be here, but I started off. But anyhow, I want to say to all the elected officials that's here today and to all of the citizens, and it is an honor and a privilege for me to be here on this his historical occasion to witness the return of this steel on his journey back home. As a person... I'm an affected in two ways by this, e this event. I was an active employee of, of then the Lucan Steel Company at the time this steel was produced for the Twin, t twin Towers in 1960. And now as the mayor of South Coastville, I'm privileged to witness the return for the rebirth of this same steel. It was a tragic event that occurred to make this day possible, but an everlasting tribute to those who lost their lives so abruptly that day. A portion of this steel will stand as a visible memorial that their lives will never be forgotten. 
If you don't mind, I just want to quote a portion of a poem. It says, careless seems the great adventure. History's lesson but record. One death grapples in the darkness, twist the system and the sword. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sprays the future and beyond the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. As we continue our expressions of appreciation to city officials, I'd like to recognize our police, uh, Chief uh, Canale and Lieutenant Bryce, and also the uh, Chief of Police of South Coast, Lou Wilson, and our, uh, uh, all the, the police who helped us so much for this day. If you're here, would you stand up? Uh, I'm looking for... Also, uh, three cheers to our fire department, who has also been very, very helpful to us in this entire project. Now, moving to the county level, it's my honor to introduce, first of all, Carol Achel, who is chairman of the Board of County Commissioners. Carol? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're coming up together because uh, we're a team here in Chester County, and, and we're, uh, we're looking forward to all the great things that will happen here. I'm Carol Achel. It's, my, uh, it's an extraordinary privilege for me to be a commissioner here in Chester County and to be in Coatesville today for this, this occasion. You know, Coatesville is the, our only city here in Chester County, and uh, this was important originally important uh, to Chester County because it was on the Brandywine River and it was a commercial hub. Uh, Moses Coates was a farmer and the first postmaster of Coatesville and this was the original farmland uh, for Chester County. When they built the Brandywine Iron Works and Nail Factory, uh, no one knew at that time that it would eventually grow into one of the most famous and respected uh, uh, steel factories in the country, Lucan Steel. Uh, Coatesville is famous for a lot of things. Uh, the first turnpike in the United States runs through Coatesville. Uh, house, it, it, Coatesville houses the longest operating steel mill in the nation, and now it will house the trees that were the first visual relics from the September 11th terrorist attack. Uh, my personal recollections of that day were as a mother. Our youngest son was uh, a senior and about to be commissioned for active duty in the United States Navy. Uh, it was my hope as, as a mother that he would not serve in wartime as his grandfather, his father, and his great-grandfather did. Uh, when I heard the news, that's, a, that's the only thought that went through my mind. Uh, if you recall, there are 28 tons of steel from the World Trade Center that are now uh, part of the USS New York, an, an, an amphibious attack uh, vessel that uh, specifically addresses uh, terrorism in, uh, in the new world order. Uh, my son uh, served four years in the Navy and has come home safely. When I, get to, when I stand before you today, the thought goes through, the only thought that goes through my mind is that I hope that those people who are serving on active duty defending this country come home safely as my son did. My thanks go to uh, our emergency services people, our firemen, our policemen. We're represented today here by uh, members of the Chester County uh, Emergency Services Center, and we've got COM1 over in the corner. So if you haven't seen COM1, go over there and see it. We are uh, a we are a special nation. I think we represent the steel represents to me the power and the strength of the people who live in this country, and uh, the power and the strength that built that steel is right here in Coatesville. So congratulations to all of you for being such an important part of uh, a nation that we can all be proud of. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Kathy Cazone. Thank you. 
Thank you. I, my name is Kathy Kizon. I'm also on the Board of Commissioners with Commissioner Rachel and Farrell, and it is my honor and privilege to be here today, to be part of, uh, of this ceremony and celebration. Um, Commissioner Rachel talked a little about Lukens. It's, Lukens is not only the longest continuously operating firm in the American iron and steel industry, it is also the only company in which a woman played a central role in early 19th century iron and steel development. Rebecca Pennock Lukens, known as the Woman of Steel, was one of the first in the nation to run a major company. At one time, Lukens was the largest employer in Chester County and helped shape the city of Coatesville with more than 5,000 workers. And Lukens was synonymous with quality. It was that quality that awarded the company the contract to manufacture the steel trees for the monumental World Trade Center building over 40 years ago. As was said earlier, the steel workers, and I know some of today's steel workers personally, work hard, they're proud of their work, and they should be proud today that these steel trees they created are coming home. I think it's right and it's fitting that these trees again take root in the city of Coatesville. We're asked to share a personal memory of that day, <clears throat> and it was, as Mr. Marking said, a very long day. It started out beautiful, just like today, blue skies, a cool breeze. I was happy. I was going to be married in four days. I was making my list of what was I going to do that day. I was supposed to remember to call my sister to wish her happy birthday because it was her birthday. And my then, my now husband, then fiance called me and told me that a plane hit the World Trade Center. <clears throat> Pardon me. And, and then another one hit. And he's known for bad jokes, so I kind of thought there was a punchline coming. Um, Unfortunately, what I got was figuratively punched in the gut. I had family and friends that worked in the towers and the surrounding trade center buildings and other sites in lower Manhattan, and nobody knew where they were. My godson was a pilot. I didn't know if he was flying. I didn't know if his plane was hijacked. Um, we didn't know where he was. I had, we had other family in the Secret Service and some who worked in the Pentagon, and we didn't know where they were. And as you all know, there was no phone service, or very little, uh, whether landline or cell phone. Um, many years earlier, I had taken the train every day into the World Trade Center as I worked in Manhattan. I could have been there. I was never so scared in all my life. I had spent so much time downtown in those buildings. I knew many people could be dead or dying, and I knew that I would know someone who didn't make it. My aunt worked three blocks from the World Trade Center at the time. We take it for granted now, but she was probably one of five people I knew who had a BlackBerry. Um, she, these are actual texts or emails uh, to my uncle. Big WTC explosion. I'm going to the street. I'm scared. That was her first frantic email message a few seconds after the first plane, hijacked plane crashed in the World Trade Center. A few exchanges later, she wrote, going to street now, very scared end of world. She and my uncle communicated with each other in these short, terse text messages for several hours as she covered in ash, fled on foot from Lower Manhattan. Eventually, I found out that my family was okay. I did lose two acquaintances that day, but my best friend, thankfully, was late for work, missed his train, unfortunately watched the towers fall from across the river. We didn't know if it would be right to have our wedding. We didn't know if we really should be celebrating, and would anybody really want to come? Family and friends who were flying in from all over the country couldn't make it. My best friend that watched the towers fall couldn't come because he was one of the many people working day and night to make certain that the financial center of our country was up and running again. But we knew that as a country, together we would mourn and together we would go on. So we decided in our own little way that we would be part of the spirit of our country. It was probably one of the most patriotic weddings I'd ever been to. As we started the reception with the national anthem, I turned around and the whole room was crying. We cried, I cried for all the people who died that day. We cried tears of pride for all of the heroes, the police, the firefighters, the EMTs, the kindness of strangers, the spirit of American citizens. And I'm proud today that these steel trees, a remembrance of the spirit, the will, 
the determination and the sacrifices of everyday Americans will be part of the revitalization of Coatesville, a symbol of the spirit and the will and the determination of the people of the city of Coatesville. Thank you for having me here today. And I'm Commissioner Terrence Farrell. Wow, what a great day and what a privilege to be here to address you all. Thank you for coming. Less than one month ago, the three commissioners were just a few blocks east of here uh, commemorating the beginning of the construction of the Riverwalk. Uh, and that symbolizes another step in Coatesville's revitalization. And this event today is further proof that Coatesville is on the way back. The county is a partner here, and as Carol said, we are a team, a team not only of three commissioners, but a team with the people of Coatesville. The county has invested more than $5 million in Coatesville in the past few years. Additional projects like this, the return of the World Trade Center steel tree, contribute greatly to Coatesville's revitalization. And as many have said, it's actually a bittersweet moment because we're here today because of what happened September 11, 2001. And each of us, I'm sure, has a very poignant memory of that day. Uh, mine began when I rolled into the parking lot at the Dague building. I was re your recorder of deeds at the time. And I was listening to NPR and Bob Edwards say that, uh, interrupt the program to say that a small plane, a Cessna, had crashed into Tower One. By the time I got into the Dague building, probably 30 seconds later, I caught up with the news as everybody had been listening to the news on a small black and white TV. Not only had a large plane crash into Tower One, but the second tower had been hit, the Pentagon had been hit, the towers had fallen. We didn't know yet about the fourth plane, but the thing I remember most about that day was the fear on people's faces in my office. And we actually closed the county early at noon and everybody went home to be with their families. No one was sure whether we were under a larger attack. We found out later we were not. It wasn't until mid-afternoon that I actually saw the first images of the South Tower and the flames bursting through that uh, structure. And someone said before, again and again and again. And my brother actually lived at the time in Manhattan and I reached out to him on the phone, but as you know, there was no phone service, and it was many hours later that I learned that he was safe. It's a day that will forever live in my memory. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and you who are in the audience who are old enough to remember that also recall exactly where you were on that fateful day also. But we're here to talk about the story of steel, the story of Coatesville, and the intertwining of those stories in the World Trade Tower. This is really a story of the workers and how they have inspired uh, many people throughout the world with their craftsmanship and building the steel, which is really symbolic of the steel in the backbone of Americans. We're here today because of the strength of America. Like Coatesville, America rose again uh, from those tragic hours in New York City, and Coatesville will continue to rise. We're very privileged and pleased to be here, and I say once again, we stand with the people of Coatesville in this revitalization project. Thank you. Our thanks indeed to the Chester County Board of Commissioners for coming and being with us today and also for the support, which yes, they are giving to Coatesville, and we are very grateful. Uh, I want to recognize the county's district attorney, Joe Carroll, who is with us. Joe, would you stand up, please? <laughs> Joe has devoted a lot of his time and personal interest to Coatesville and its problems and helping to solve them, and we're all very, very grateful uh, for it. All these reminiscences uh, are touching, and I think everyone has some touch. I fortunately didn't have any family or friends there, but I can remember during a tour of my alma mater at Villanova last summer, I was taken into a chapel, and I was shown a very handsome stained glass window, which depicted the, um, the, the buildings in New York, 
and uh, well, the names of some 16 or 18 Villanovans who had worked in various offices who were lost in that. And so I think the tragedy touched everyone. Well, now we're going to have a musical interlude played by the Lucan's band. So if you will, please. Thank you very much for those inspiring melodies. Uh, you played the Navy hymn, as I recall. And there's a touch there because we know that one of the trees is going to go to the Navy SEALs to be erected at their headquarters in Virginia Beach. We met one of the officers from the SEALs while Scott and I were over negotiating. And I think it's very appropriate that other groups are going to be recognizing it as well. At this point, I think I should tell you that the Lucan's Band has been part of our history and tradition here for quite a long time. 
And as it happens next year, they will be celebrating the 100th anniversary of their establishment in 1911. So how about a round of applause for the Lucans Band? Well, one of the pleasures of uh, emceeing a group like this is the opportunity to thank so many people who have been involved with this. Our program committee, uh, Bruce M uh, Mowdy, who did a lot of work for us. And our staff members, Sharon Tanderish, Kathy Franciscus, and uh, Melinda Williams, who uh, has been doing the publicity and public relations for us. Also, we acknowledge so many people who did so much from small, all our volunteers, and I can't name them all, but we are grateful. Also, our photo expert and program director, Sam Razaviliak, who is here in the group somewhere. We want to thank him. He came down uh, from New York with the group to photograph it en route. We like to honor our Rebecca Lukens awardees. Uh, four years ago, we established an award to honor those people who exemplified the characteristics of Rebecca. And we have three of them here. First of all, Mary Sullivan. Please stand. Mary Sullivan is a special colleague. She and I uh, established the Greystone Society way back in 1984. And Mary worked with a huge amount of uh, time and devotion. Our second awardee was Jane Davidson. Jane. <laughs> who served for many years uh, as uh, county's historic preservation officer. And I had a great deal of pleasure uh, working with Jane when she surveyed the city to get much of it put on the National Register. And our third awardee is Barbara Travellini. Is Barbara here? Well, anyway, I guess she didn't make it today, but we appreciate all her help that she gave us. Uh, it's now my uh, pleasure. We had hoped that Senator uh, Rafferty could be with us, but unfortunately he is in session in Harrisburg. But we have his assistant, Julia Harper, who will give you greetings from him. Julia, please. Good evening. My name is Julia Harper, and I represent Senator Rafferty. I work for Senator Rafferty in his Chester County District Office. Um, he was unable to attend today because, like Jean said, he is in session. But he wanted to thank the Houston family and Greystone for bringing the trees back to Coatesville. It's a great day in Coatesville, and we hope to see many great days to come. Thank you. We had also hoped to have with us today Congressman Joseph Pitts, who unfortunately is busy in Washington and couldn't be here. I want to say a very special thanks to him, though. Uh, in the early stages of this project, when we learned that the World Trade Authority had kept many of these pieces, we were wondering how to get to them. And through his good offices, his congressional office, Joe made the original contacts with the New York, New Jersey Port Authority. And it was in the summer of 06 that a delegation of us, including two representatives of Joe's office, went over there. So we have a very special gratitude to Joe for really getting this going. Representing him here today is his office uh, assistant, uh, Nick Kamuff. Nick, would you please? <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nicholas Kamuff, and I'm here on behalf of Congressman Joe Pitts. He can't be here this evening because they are in session, and he's down in DC voting. Uh, we are very pleased to have been part of this project from making the initial contacts, opening the doors many years ago to providing layers of support for the release of the steel. I personally recall being uh, the original navigator on that initial trip to the hangar in JFK Airport with Gene, Scott, his father, among others. I'm just going to read a brief statement from Congressman Pitts. I am very pleased to see the return of many of the steel trees manufactured in Coatesville for the World Trade Center buildings. Pennsylvania workers were proud to see their handiwork become such an essential part of these great buildings and shocked and saddened to see the violent destruction wrought by the terrorist attacks. Now, with the return of these pieces, the victims of 9-11 can be memorialized here in Chester County, 
For years now, I've worked with state and federal officials to release some of these trees, and I'm glad the museum can now proceed with its plans to properly display these sections of the Twin Towers in the community that manufactured them. Thank you very much. I also want to recognize a member of city council, Ingrid Jones. Would you please stand? Since I live in her district, uh, she represents me. I'm happy to have you here. Now I'm going to have uh, Representative Tim Hennessy address you. And without further ado, Tim. Thank you, Jean. Uh, good evening. The Pennsylvania House of Representatives is not in session today, so I'm not playing hooky. Uh, I'm actually working. Uh, but if I was to play hooky for any reason at all, it would be to be here with you on this significant event today. It is a thrill for me to be here and a privilege to be in the company of so many first responders, police and firefighters, uh, and especially, let me see if I get this right, John Sorzella, Paul Sincomani, and Anthony Yezu, who are retired from the Fire Department of New York, but were there present at, at uh, Ground Zero uh, on September 11th of 2001. As Commissioner Farrell said, what a day it is here in Coatesville. As we watch these steel trees from the World Trade Center arriving here in the city, we reaffirm their importance as reminders of the soaring American spirit and of our unbreakable determination to stand tall against our enemies. The men and women of Lucan Steel and everyone in Coatesville takes enormous pride in the fact that these steel trees, the work of their hands and the fruits of their labor, withstood the unspeakably horrific attack on 9-11 and came to symbolize the strength of American resolve in the ongoing day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year struggle we must wage against hatred and evil against intolerance and terror. As we celebrate their return to us in Coatesville, where they were forged and shaped and received their strength, we celebrate yet another step in the resurgence of this city, a process of rebirth. I think Commissioner Farrell called it a process of revitalization, of renaissance, that's already begun and will no doubt continue simply because it must. The steel from the World Trade Center symbols the strength, the grit, and the determination of the men and women of our military who fight for us today. Each day they face danger with courage. Each day they bravely confront our enemies at every level. And each day they uphold the honor of America and make us proud. The steel in their backbone equals the strength of these trees. May God bless them in their mission as they defend all of us with valor and integrity and brave, bravery worthy of our nation. These trees, these relics from the World Trade Center, will grace the proposed National Iron and Steel Museum here in our city. And in doing so, they will close a circle 41 years in the making. These trees were forged here, they supported the magnificent World Trade Center towers for 30 years, and now they return to stand vigilant in the Iron and Steel Museum. On behalf of the men and women of Luke and Steel and for all of Coatesville, we welcome them home. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for your great words. Here representing Governor Rendell, who unfortunately could not be with us today, is, I'm pleased to say, his cultural representative, his cultural advisor, Martha McGeeris Snyder. Martha, please. The governor sends his sincerest regrets for not being able to attend today's important ceremony as he is in Washington, D.C., serving the Commonwealth. But he asked me to convey to you his pride and the pride of all Pennsylvanians as we honor these trees of steel and the symbol of enduring character that they have become for our nation. As we welcome back these relics of courage, we humbly honor the memory of those who perished in the tragedy of 9-11 and we salute the steel workers who created the steel for these monumental buildings. 
We are especially honored to create this unique place of remembrance and appreciation of its legacy. It is altogether fitting that these steel trees will serve as the keynote, the keystone of the new National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum, which will inspire our citizens to learn more about the rich history of Coatesville and Chester County. The governor commends this, um, the immense dedication and efforts of Eugene DiOrio and Scott Houston, the Houston Foundation and family, and their colleagues and local political and business leaders for so many years that they have been the driving force behind the creation of the National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum. They have been the unwavering advocates for the preservation of the story that shaped the iron and steel industry and the lives of so many Americans. Just as these steel trees remained standic, standing after the horrific events of 9-11, let us rededicate ourselves to standing proudly for the strength and principles upon which this nation was founded. Let this day serve as the beginning of a new era for Coatesville, born of the grit and courage that forged this industry and our nation, and for future generations to remember and honor this is indeed a historic day for Coatesville, Pennsylvania, and the country. Thank you. God bless America. Thank you, Martha, for those most gracious words. We are grateful for your presence. We will have a closing prayer by the Reverend Joe Tyson, the pastor of the Olivet Methodist uh, Church. Reverend Tyson? Oh. We have come here today to honor and to remember 9-11, a day that transformed and changed our nation. It may have been the intention of those who attacked us to change us in one way, but the change that occurred was a miraculous transformation to make us one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, this day we have gathered to honor the memory of those who perished and to honor the labor of those who worked in the mills. We remember those, we, we give thanks for those who have given so diligently of themselves in time and energy and resources to return these trees to Coatesville. And now, Lord, we pray your blessing upon our nation and upon our city. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to have the grand finale, another band number. <laughs> Having worked uh, several times with the uh, Lucan's band, several of them know of my passion for the music of John Philip Sousa. So when we were working uh, for this program, they asked, well, what do you want us to play? I said, well, you have to finish with Stars and Stripes Forever. But first, a little story. Uh, the story goes that John Philip Sousa, who wrote many, many marches, of course, was called the March King, a friend and associate asked him one time, what would your favorite selection be among your own compositions if you had to choose one? And Sousa wrote back in a delightful letter, my choice would be the stars and stripes forever. I could meet my maker face to face with the inspiration that comes from its melodies and the patriotism that gives it being. And the melodies are wonderful, and the inspiration, I believe Congress some years ago did designate Stars and Stripes as our national march. And on this occasion, when we are feeling most patriotic today, I've asked the band to conclude our program with the Stars and Stripes forever. So, if you please.
Thank you. 